Hey everyone, another day that the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glad in it that we're venturing forth and diving deep into the Word of God. Maybe not deep, but at least 10 minutes into it a day um, is a beautiful thing. Um, Go more into it, you'll get more out of it. That's what the Spirit of God does um, as we continue to search and seek um, God's will, His ways, His Word for the betterment, not just of our lives, but just of our betterment of our relationship with Him. Knowing Him better gets to know us better. And so we can look at that mirror. And that's what happens today, of being able to connect these two writings. Um, and that's what they were. It really was one writing before. I know I mentioned that in the last video. Uh, but Ezra and Nehemiah, until about the 400s, did they kind of separate, uh, 400 AD, did they really separate these works? Uh, but they were really seen all together because it is a part of the same narrative. And so I want to take you through that history real quickly of when Cyrus, the king of Persia in 537 uh, BC, I'm going to throw some uh, uh, dates at you real quickly. So it might be helpful to grab a pen and a paper or maybe jot in your Bibles uh, real quick about these this narrative that's coming forth in Ezra, Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Esther, uh, because that's also involved in this. So Cyrus, king of Persia, comes into reign, he 539, but at 537, he kind of pushed that, puts that first band of people of the exiles back into Jerusalem underneath the leadership of Zerubbabel. And he says, go and build the temple back in Jerusalem. So they do that. Um, the second wave of people is underneath Ezra. Uh, Ezra, this priest, this uh, one who's going to bring about the law of the Lord, he's brought back as well about 60 years later. Um, we get to see that about four 58, about 458 BC, Ezra comes in the picture, that wave of people that come forth and being able to bring back the spiritual condition, um, raise up the worshipers, raise up bringing back the law of God to the people back in Jerusalem and Israel. So that's that second wave. First wave, Zerubbabel. Second wave, Ezra, as they're coming back. 60 years in between those two waves. And that gives us the picture. That's the dates right there in between that 60 year is when Esther reigned as queen of Persia. And so we're going to get to Esther after Nehemiah, but just kind of setting that date for you. In in between those two waves, Esther is in Persia as a Jew, being able to bring about God's provision for her people, as we see, to be able to bring about. She was put in that place for such a time. As this, and that's as that's that uh, famous phrase in Esther. So we got uh, we got uh, Zerubbabel first wave, Esther in between the the first wave of Zerubbabel and also Ezra, and then about 13 years later, we get to see that third wave of people underneath uh, kind of the leadership of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah is what we're going to be reading here in these next days. In Nehemiah chapter one is where we are, uh, but Nehemiah is known as that cupbearer to the king of Persia, but also this governor of his people, this leader of his people to bring back to build the walls around Jerusalem. And so this is where we get to know Nehemiah a little bit because he's praying to God and there's no better way to know a person than to be able to talk to God with them. And I, I love that of being able to pray with one another, but being able to hear the prayers and the confession on somebody's heart to be able to actually know what they're speaking to their creator. And that's what we get to see here in Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's read together. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev in, Kislev, in the uh, 20th year, we're looking at November, December, in the, in the month of Kislev is uh, November, December time frame. Um, and what we're looking for there, um, as it says in my notes here, is it's about 446 BC. So this is 445, he comes back. Um, 446 is when he's uh, confronting and being confronted with what's happening in Jerusalem. In the month of Kislev, November, December, in the 20th year, 446 BC, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. 
Now, this happened in Babylon's takeover. Nebuchadnezzar came in and just absolutely ransacked Jerusalem in 586 B.C. That's one of the major dates um, within, this, within the scriptures. 586 is that last, boom, uh, to Jerusalem from Nebuchadnezzar. And he, he just decimated the walls, burned the, uh, the gates. But this is also the reality that they, they, they've been trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem for some time here. Um, even in amongst those first couple waves, they started to build the wall and they couldn't do it. There was that opposition, as you remember in Ezra, there's opposition um, around them. And if they build up those walls, they have security. And so this was a big deal for cities to have walls or not have walls. If you don't have walls, you really don't have protection from the enemy. They can march right into your city. But if you have walls, you have watchmen on those walls. And you will be able to be uh, safe and secure. Verse 4, Nehemiah says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, here's his prayer. O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I really love how this prayer, and it's always great to um, contrast but also relate prayers to one another. Um, Nehemiah's prayer is very similar, as we get to see here, putting that title first, our Father in heaven, right? Oh Lord, God of heaven, right? Hallowed be your name. How great and awesome God you are, who keeps his covenant, right? And you can kind of see this mirror of being able to say, what a reverence and what an incredible honor He's giving within this prayer first and then being able to go down through this prayer as well of asking, be attentive to your servant because I'm not necessarily coming on just my own needs. I'm coming on to the needs of your people, Israel. It says, I confess the sins we Israelites, including, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. So he's not trying to puff himself up. It's I've sinned, they've sinned, we're before you, holy God, awesome God. And now this is my prayer of being able to go forth. Verse 7, we have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. And that's just kind of taken out of Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 5. He's promising these things. He promised this covenant. He promised this uh, reality towards Moses. He's going to gather the people together. So Nehemiah says, I, we remember your law. I pray that you remember that as well. I'm just reminding you of that. You, you can scatter your people because of unfaithfulness, but you promised to gather your people in faithfulness, your faithfulness. Remember that, O Lord, and be gracious to us. Verse 10, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was a cupbearer to the king. We get to know Nehemiah today that he is a faithful man, especially a faithful man of prayer. Knows who the God of heaven is, knows the, knows the narrative of who God is. He's the one who's redeemed his people. He also is the one that actually enacts justice and, and goes according to his law. And so when people are unfaithful or disobedient, he has them brought into exile. He uses instruments of nations around to be able to actually pursue them. And as he has that happened within the instruments, he, he doesn't lose his covenant that he's going to redeem his people, rescue his people. And he does that, yes, through the Persians, bringing them back to Jerusalem. But yet here we are still as sinful people. So Nehemiah is faithful in prayer, but he's also faithful in his vocation. A cupbearer to the king of Persia, as we get to see there. As a cupbearer, he was one that was well attentive towards the needs of the king, but also well known and trustworthy. To the king. A cupbearer was one that would actually try and, and uh, drink the cup of the king before it would get to the king so that it wouldn't be poisoned, so that there wouldn't even uh, be something towards 
the illness towards the, um, the death of the king. And so this trustworthy, faithful person, Nehemiah, we get to know, is trustworthy and faithful, not just to the king, but as he's saying to the servant, being a servant of God. And so a prayer goes out, wants to enact the faithfulness of God, remind God of his covenant, and reminding God, yes, we are sinners, but you are an awesome, faithful, redeeming God. And so as that's put forth, it's just going to weave its way through this narrative. You're faithful, God, and even you can do things with unfaithful people. And how beautiful that is for us. What an incredible testament to us today. Unfaithful that we are to God's will, God's way, God's word. As we look into that mirror, we can just confess. We can actually confess in our prayers as well. Lord, I'm not getting it right. Lord, I have been disobedient. I've been sinful. But you are faithful and you are righteous and you will redeem me by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so do that work this day. Let us come into confession before God, not hiding our sins, but being bold in that, not excusing our sin and being able to just go on sinning so that grace abounds by no means. No, let us confess and be before God in prayer, knowing full well that yes, we are unfaithful and we sin, but we have a God that is faithful and redeeming. And he'll do that work this day through the power of his spirit, by the blood, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's what you've been called to. You've been called to the life. You've been called into the body of Jesus Christ. Redeemed. Set free. Not to sin, but to be faithful and to be able to be faithful to God in all that we do this day. Have a blessed day as you look to and as you strive, as you pray, but as you walk forth in faithfulness towards God.